Okay, so I'm very pleased to start the last session of the Congress. So today's first speaker is Grzegorz Zwara from Torun. He is associated with Torun for a long time. He completed his education at Nicolaus Copernicus University in Torun, got his PhD and habilitation and also his professorship. But he travels also to Germany several times, to Bielefeld and Wuppertal, and of course to Oberwolfach, and has several collaborators in Germany. And his uh, scientific interest is algebra on the border of algebraic geometry, or if you prefer, with the flavor of, of geometry because he's interested in uh, representations and moduli of algebraic objects, so in particular in representation of quivers, degenerations or deformations of commutative, uh, sorry, <laughs> non-commutative, finite dimensional algebras. And today he, he will present uh, a talk on three fundamental theorems on the representation of associative algebras. So I'm very pleased to, to welcome Grzegorz Zwara. Okay, uh, guten Morgen. <laughs> Hello, is, thank you very much for kind invitation. And this is opportunity uh, for me to talk about representation theory of algebras. Well, maybe more um, traditional. Uh, this is theory that, of course, you can find roots in uh, 19th century, but as many subjects also in ancient times and so on, but I don't want to go such uh, deep in time. Uh, this, this theory uh, developed uh, rapidly since, I would say, the beginning of 1970s. And uh, so first, first of all, we work over an algebraically closed field of arbitrary characteristic. Always you can think about complex uh, complex field. Sometimes characteristic has some meaning in this theory. Quite often results are independent of the characteristic of the field. And by A, we denote an associative finite dimensional K algebra. So, say, a ring with additional structure uh, of K vector space. And some few examples that we, we, we can have in mind. First of all, uh, field of uh, field itself is the simplest K algebra, then you can take product of algebras to get new algebra, so K to power N. We can think about the, uh, the algebra of square N times N matrices, or maybe not all matrices, consider uh, upper triangular matrices, they form also algebra here, just it's easier to, to, to take of size 3, so B3 K. You can think about uh, polynomial algebra, of course, is infinite dimensional as a vector space. So we take truncated polynomial algebra. We can take polynomial algebra in two variables divided by x square, y square. Easily you f can find that as a vector space has dimension four. Well, some series of example you get if you consider group algebra. So you take uh, a finite group G and then elements correspond uh, to uh, vectors in basis of KG and multiplication on these basis vectors is according to the action, group multiplication in the group. It's a well-known example. And we are not interested in, in algebras itself, but how they are represented. So what I mean, uh, we are interested in the category of finite dimensional modules of uh, algebra A. And because in many cases we consider 
algebra which are not commutative, we should restrict the, uh, that either we we consider left or right doesn't ma matter much. But okay, so we consider here during this talk left modules. And let me quickly recall what means uh, a module. So. We have underlying uh, vector space that we assume that this is finite dimensional, and then um, action of, of this algebra A on the set V, so bilinear map, which satisfies usual conditions that multiplication by, uh, by unit of algebra is identity, uh, and yeah, that commutes this. Uh, this is we, uh, yeah, it's the other law. Uh, well, what is, of course, if we talk about category, we only, uh, we consider modules and homomorphies between them. Homomorphies as are linear maps of underlying vector space which commute with action of, of A. Uh, so, in order to study uh, this category of modules, it's important to consider indecomposable objects. So, module is called indecomposable if the following condition satisfies. If we can uh, represent M, so M is isomorphic to direct sum of two other modules, then at least one of them must be zero module. So there is some similarity like, I would say, integers and prime numbers. Uh, so the same as any integer number decomposes as a product of prime numbers, say uniquely, so it means up to up to order and also up to that we can present six as two times three or minus two times minus three, but in, uh, essentially it's unique. And the same with modules, so M decomposes into direct sum of indecomposable modules and uniquely up to order and isomorphism classes of these, these modules. Moreover, here I consider direct sum, finite direct sum, so the finite direct sum, finite direct products the same, and if we consider homomorphic spaces, so homomorphic spaces between direct sum, uh, modules which are direct sums of others, is canonically isomorphic to direct sum of homomorphic spaces between these components M, I, and J. As a result, to describe the category of modules, we can restrict to indecomposable A modules and homomorphies between them. Then we understand our full uh, category. Well, let's look at some examples that of algebras. What can we say about modules over them? So let's say not too much complicated example, let A be the field, then the category of modules is of course the category of K vector spaces. And somehow theorem that each vector space has a basis is, is almost immediately translated uh, to the fact that we have up to isomorphism unique in the composable A module which is just one dimensional vector space. So and a vector space can be decomposed into direct sum of one-dimensional subspaces. Well, a little more complicated, but not much. Example, uh, the algebra of square matrices. Here also we have only one up to isomorphism in the composable A module, namely uh, K to N. So th this we consider action of A on this as a multiplication on the space of say column uh, column uh, matrices, and any finite dimensional modules is isomorphic to direct sum of such such uh, in the composable. Well, somehow these examples are similar. These mm, one can say that these algebras are Morita equivalent categories of modules are. Uh, equivalent. Little more complicated example, namely poly truncated polynomial uh, algebra in one variable, kx divided by uh, ideal generated by x to the power n. Then you can find n indecomposable objects, 
They are given by kx divided by x to some power i, where i is not greater than n. So we have one dimension, one in the, comp in the composable module of dimension one, one of dimension two, and up to dimension three, uh, up to dimension n. Well, next example, polynomial algebra in two variables, x, y, divided by x square, y square. And here, this the situation that we have infinitely many isomorphism classes of indecomposable objects. In this exam particular example, we understand very well how they look, but th these form some discrete series, some uh, series, uh, uh, series dependent on one scalar, and well, very similar algebras we will consider soon. Well, I would like to spend a little more time on example of these upper triangular matrices. So here, just convenient to, 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 to do some pictures, so only of size 3, but the same will, uh, will be true for arbitrary size. We take this six-dimensional algebra, upper triangular matrices. Here we take three special elements of this algebra, namely matrices with unique non-zero coefficients one uh, on the diagonal, so E1, E2, E3. E Basic properties of these elements are the following, namely they sum up to one, due to the unit of algebra. They are idempotent, so EI square is the same as EI. Moreover, they are pairwise orthogonal, so uh, EI times EJ is zero whenever I is different than J. Well, this is first step to define quiver for this algebra. We associate with uh, the following quiver. So let me say what I mean by quiver. It's uh, dir finite directed uh, graph with possible loops, multiple arrows, and so on. Just finite number of vertices, uh, finite number of arrows. And here in our example, we have three vertices, one, two, three. In fact, they correspond to, they correspond to, to this uh, idempotence, uh, E1, E2, E3. And moreover, two other elements of this algebra correspond to, to arrows alpha and beta. Well, and why we do this? Because, oh, uh, of course, uh, Representations of quivers, similar like modules over algebra, they form abelian category. Uh, so what is representation of the quiver? In each vert with each vertex, we uh, associate vector space, in our situation, finite dimensional vector space, and with each arrow corresponding linear map between chosen uh, vector spaces. What is homomorphism between two representations? So here I wrote representation u, which consists of vector spaces u1, u2, u3, and two linear maps u alpha and u beta. And similar representation v. Homomorphism is just collection of linear maps between uh, vector spaces, like this f1, f2, and f3, such that for each arrow we have commutativity. So for example, for al alpha, this means that composition of u alpha and f1 is the same as uh, composition of f2 and v alpha. And the same for, uh, for beta in our example. Um, so this is abelian category which behaves almost the same as module category. And in our example, module category is equivalent to the category of representations over this quiver. Working over representations of quiver is usually much easier. Uh, we consider um, vector spaces of smaller dimension, uh, matrices of smaller size, and it's, um, it's a special case of more general phenomena. Well, 
So if we want to describe indecomposable A modules, it's the same as indecomposable representations of this quiver Q. Uh, you can easily find that there are six of them. These are representations that in each uh, vertex we have zero or one dimensional vector space and whenever we have uh, two uh, one dimensional uh, vector spaces connected by arrow then we just as a linear map consider some linear isomorphism. Uh, so for this category these the first three objects are simple objects Mm, so, namely, any repre finite dimensional representation has uh, series that the quotient of sub-representation uh, sub that the quotients are isomorphic to simple objects. Uh, so, the other representations are of dimension 2, 2 and 3. So, they correspond, of course, to indecomposable A modules. How we do this? As a vector space, we take direct sum of these vector spaces. So, for instance, this corresponds to three-dimensional A module, mm, which in fact is like the space of uh, column, column matrices and action of A is just multiplication on left. Well, in general, so this is the first fact that I wanted to, to present due to Gabriel in 90, around 1970. Uh, given any finite dimensional associative algebra A, there is bound quiver QI, so what is finite quiver we understand, and there are some more relations such that the category of modules is equivalent to the category of representations of the bound quiver QI. We understand what are representations of the quiver Q and if we have bound quiver it means we don't consider all representation. They must satisfy some relations so we get subcategory. And this theorem had really big impact since then uh, people could calculate uh, could describe in decomposable modules over many finite dimensional algebras in much easier way and uh, it helped a lot in many classification problems and since since today quite often we uh, we think about modules as representations of bound quivers and as this is equivalent and yeah so this is the first theorem with big impact. The second is about Auslander right and theory, a little later development, first by Auslander, then uh, later with co collaboration of Auslander right and uh, theory. So let me recall the uh, notion of projective and injective modules. Uh, we can define it in this way. Module P is projective if and only if for arbitrary surjective homomorphism between modules from N2 to N3 and arbitrary homomorphism from P to N3, there is homomorphism P to N2 making this triangle commutative, oh, which means composition of the, these two maps is, is this vertical one. And dual notion of injective, uh, injective modules for arbitrary injective homomorphism between modules N1 and N2 and arbitrary homomorphism from N1 to I. There exists uh, homomorphism from N2 to I making this triangle commutative. Um, in general, uh, theory of modules over rings, these objects were considered. In the situation of finite dimensional modules over finite dimensional algebra situation is very simple. Uh, namely, we can choose idempotence E1, En in algebra A. Well, they are, per, uh, they are primitive, which means they cannot be decomposed into sums of small, say, smaller idempotence. 
they don't necessarily sum to one because uh, algebras we consider uh, are not necessarily so-called basic algebras. So uh, maximal ma uh, known uh, fact is that maximal semi-simple semi subalgebra of given algebra is the on this is situation over algebraic closed field is the product of uh, square matrix uh, square matrix algebras and if these square matrices are of size one so product of k this is situation of basic algebras then we have condition that this idempotent sum to unit otherwise we we need to choose only some representants of of idempotents nevertheless Always there are there is finite number n, and idempotents are uh, e1, e n in algebra A such that up to isomorphism there are exactly n in the composable projective A modules, and they are given by A times e i. So we have multiplication uh, multiplication or uh, by A on the left and Idempotent means that this is projective modules and uh, primitive that this is indeed composable. Duality, we have also up to isomorphism n injective objects. For this, we consider right projective A modules and then dualize. And in this way, we get our injective modules. Well, also up to isomorphism, we have n simple, uh, simple modules. However, in most cases, we have much more, uh, much bigger world of modules, quite often infinite. And we want to find other indecomposable modules than projective, simple, or injective. Well, <coughs> then there we have notion of of almost split sequences or later uh, uh, named uh, auslander right and sequences. So we consider short exact sequence in category of modules. By this I mean that C, D, E are finite dimensional A modules, F and G are homomorphism. F is injective, G is subjective, and exactness in the middle means that image of F is exactly the kernel of G. And such short exact sequence is called almost split if, and now a little long definition, if the ends of this short exact sequence, so modules C and E, are indecomposable, if F is not a section, let me say that F section means that this sequence is splitable so that the D is isomorphic to direct sum of C plus E, and we are not cons uh, we don't want such situation. So F is not a section. Equivalently, we, we, we could say G is not retraction, so there is not uh, homomorphism from E to D such that composition is identity on E. And for arbitrary module X and arbitrary homomorphism to uh, E, which is not retraction, there exists homomorphism, so from X to D, making this upper triangular commutative, uh, somehow equivalently, for arbitrary module Y and arbitrary homomorphisms from C to Y, which is not a section, uh, we have homomorphism from D to Y uh, making this lower triangular commutative. So we can think about this that G is not retraction but is somehow closest to it as possible. So any non-retraction must factorize through, th through this G. So it's in some sense it's minimal uh, homomorphism. The same F is minimal non-section. And First question is if such exact sequences exist, so probably yes, if we consider them. And what's more we can say about it? Well, I put here not uh, 
original definition, I put much more conditions. Some of them are consequences of the former conditions and so on. And the second uh, theorem which gave really big impact in, in development of, of representation theory of algebras is due to Alexander Wrighton and Wrighton. If C is in decomposable module, which is not injective, oh, maybe I should mention just uh, from the definition, if we have almost split sequence, C cannot be injective. If C is injective, automatically the exact sequence splits, so, so F, F is a section. Well, and the same E cannot be projective. So if C is in decomposable module, which is not injective, then there is an almost split sequence starting at C. Well, in fact, the sequence is in some sense unique, unique up to isomorphism of uh, short exact sequences. So we can say unique. Everything in algebra is up to some isomorphism if we consider categories and so on. Uh, and duality, if E is not projective in the composable module, then there exists unique short exact, uh, almost speed sequence ending at e, at e. So in our world of indecomposable modules over A, we have project e and projective modules and injective, and whenever we uh, module is not projective, we have almost split uh, sequence ending at uh, this module and similar uh, for non-injective. And then, if we try to classify in decomposable objects uh, for algebras, and for many of them we can, it's very natural to try to uh, construct almost split sequences. Thanks to this, we have much bigger understanding of the, of the category of modules, so how homomorphism somehow looks between them, because these, these uh, F and G are somehow minimal, and uh, homomorphism, uh, in some situation, homomorphism always are a linear combination of composition of such, uh, such uh, homomorphism. I'm not precise at the moment, but, well, they play uh, important ro role. So it's important to know almost speed sequences for given algebras. So there are many tools, uh, there, there were many tools developed and we know how to calculate uh, them in many cases. And then uh, this was, up to my knowledge, independent idea of Ringel uh, and Rittmann uh, to concede, to try to glue together this almost split sequences. So to form some, another uh, oriented graph, uh, which not necessarily is finite this time, but is called uh, quiver. Quiver associated with algebra A, so gamma A, Aus, nowadays called uh, Auslander right and quiver of algebra. So as the vertices, this, uh, we take isoclasses of indecomposable modules. And as arrows, something connected to this, uh, say, almost, uh, almost sections, almost retraction considered in almost speed sequences. Uh, so I don't want to give precise, uh, precise definition of it, just to look, look at some example. For our algebra that we had six indecomposable representations, I didn't uh, name them, but I, now I can explain. They form the following Auslander uh quiver. So we have here some, say, triangle. This corresponds to one almost split sequence. This corresponds to another almost split sequence. We starting uh, starting at P2, middle term P3 plus direct sum P3 and S2, and ending at I2. 
And the last almost split sequ uh, sequence starting at S2 with middle term I2 and I3. Well, representations or modules, uh, we identify them. At the bottom line, there are simple objects. So this is simple, uh, this representation that had in the first vertex K and other zero, in middle vertex uh, K, this was S2 and here the third. On the same time, these three uh, modules P1, P2, P3 are exactly three projective representations. So P1 is at the same time simple and projective. And Quiver was like this, right? So the simple projective objects is considered. You ask about S three. I3, okay. I understand. I mean, quite often people make mistakes about left and right modules, and this is this. So, so if I did this, I'm, uh, I apologize. Quite often I try to really keep in mind if I take left and right. But okay. So, if this is not correct, you you should dualize. So indices one, two, three deep, uh, on three, two, uh, one. But well, essentially it's still. Uh, I mean, this is the same. Auslander right and quiver, and uh, still the modules in this line, the, these are injectives. Yeah, so here we have a situation that each module is uh, in decomposable projective or injective or simple or maybe even this. So this module here, which should be, this is this three dimensional, which is the same time projective and injective. And well, the knowledge of Auslander right and quiver helps a lot. So, for in, for instance, uh, for instance, for algebra, so-called finite representation type. By this, I mean that up to isomorphism, we have only finitely many indecomposable A modules, finite dimensional, or this implies that. Uh, also arbitrary. Uh, then, so uh, Auslander right and quiver is finite, and with knowledge of, of this quiver, we can recover somehow the category of modules. With one exception, if field K is pathological and situation is pathological, so characteristic different than two works, in characteristic two, there are some uh, cases uh, that we can have two algebras, non-isomorphic, 
with isomorphic Auslander right and quiver. Uh, well, this is not case in our example because then we need that this Auslander right and uh, quiver has oriented cycles. Um, also, knowledge of Auslander right and quiver in case of algebras of infinite type, representation type, gives us better understanding. Not uh, we cannot fully recover module category, but we, we can say a lot about module category. Well, uh, consider we, uh, we identify modules, representations, so uh, easier for me instead of consider to consider some four dimensional algebras, uh, we consider Kronecker quivers, two vertices and two ar arrows between them in the same direction. Uh, the, we have infinitely many indecomposable representations of this quiver. Uh, they are well known and we can describe them. So we have two discrete series in this in, uh, with index n n greater or equal one. So here, denoted by Pn, we have a re representation with vector spaces of dimension n and n minus 1. And uh, here, just some maps that we have injections, uh, embeddings into first n minus 1 components and last n minus 1 components. Here, dual situation, projections from n-dimensional vector space to n minus 1. And this is not all because so in so in dimension uh, in dimension say if we take some of these dimensions so in dimension 2n minus 1 we have two isomorphous classes of uh, in the composite representations but in even dimensions we have infinitely many of them we can describe the following uh, way, so we have two copies of n-dimensional vector space. Here we have identity matrix and Jor Jordan uh, normal block form with eigenvalue lambda of size n. This way, changing scalar lambda, we get f family of pairwise non-isomorphic objects. Only one is missing. Uh, here we denote by uh, r infinite n. So here we take Jordan blocks form with eigenvalue zero, so nilpotent matrix and identity at the bottom. These together form something more like projective line. Okay, so anyway, we see that uh, in dimension 2n, indecomposable depends on one parameter, lambda. If we consider another example, polynomial algebra, there is a small problem, namely I said let A be finite dimensional algebra. Polynomial algebra is not finite dimensional, but this is really one special exception. Finite dimensional uh, representations behaves similar to the case when algebras are finite dimensional. And we can classify them much easier than the previous example, In each dimension n, we have family, one parameter family of indecomposable representations. Then we can describe them as a kx divided by x minus lambda to the power n. And then we have induced action of uh, the polynomial algebra, kx. Uh, this algebra serves us as a, mm, in, a, in a way that we could define some kind of algebras that uh, in the composable behave similar, more precisely. The algebra A is called tame or of tame representation type. If for any dimension d greater or equal one, there are a finite number of exact functors, f1 up to f, uh, say, n sub d. Functors from the category of, 
of modulus over kx. So, well, of course, object modulus, we can consider this is a vector space with, with an endomorphism on it. Uh, to the category of our A modules, such that almost all in the composable d-dimensional A modules, so almost all means all but a finite number of isoclasses, the dimensional A modules, are of the form, they are images of this one-dimensional uh, in the composable, so sim simple uh, kx, uh, kx modules. In spite of this de definition, in the previous example, uh, Exactly, this, these modules can be obtained as uh, imag images of, of, of corresponding exact functor functors. So for each, uh, if we apply for all the dimensions we don't need because we have only two in the composable classes, uh, isomorphic classes for in the composable, and for even we consider one such functor. So this and the, in this for D, even is equal one. Well, there is definition all uh, we have tame algebra, so we should expect wild algebras. And in fact, there is definition of wild algebras, little more complicated. Namely, the algebra A is wild if there is an exact functor F from the category of finite dimensional modules over free algebra in two variables, k, x, y. If someone doesn't like such algebras, you can replace by polynomial ring in two variables also, it's tr uh, everything will hold. To module uh, category of A modules, these exact functors must satisfy two additional conditions, namely uh, respect isomorphism classes. So if we have two non-isomorphic modules over this free algebra, the images are also non-isomorphic. And the second property is uh, that image of indecomposable module is, is uh, indecomposable. Well, over this free algebra in two variables, you can find in small dimensions already uh, that in the composable modules form two parameter, three parameter, and so on families. So of, you know, depending on arbitrary number of parameters, this situation is really complicated. Moreover, uh, there are such functors between category of modules of, of this free algebra in two variables and three variables and four variables. So. Not formally, people in representation theory of algebras say that if you understand in the composable object, uh, in the composable modules over this free algebra in two variables, you understand in the composable modules over any finitely generated algebra, S and class such classification are called hopeless problems. So this is not formal statement, but we don't have hope to classify them. We uh, for wild algebras, we can describe some special kind of modules, some special kind of homomorphism, or some other kind of problem. But for full classification, there is no hope. And this is not difficult to see that algebra cannot be at the same time uh, tame and wild. So there are exclusive classes. But very my the, third, the last theorem I wanted to present uh, that. I think is very important, is due to Drost called wild tame dichotomy. That every finite dimensional algebra is either tame or wild, of course, uh, exclusively. So the world of finite dimensional algebras over algebra, uh, an algebraically closed field is divided into two class, uh, two disjoint classes. And such nice theorem has no nice proofs. This, 
At the end of 80s, those proofs, uh, the first proofs were written in, in Russian, which make even more difficult for so our society to understand. Uh, later, uh, there were other explanations. Other authors try to uh, try to um, find other proofs. They are a little easier, but still, I would say heavy proofs. And first of all, they, uh, the proofs are beyond of the world of finite dimensional algebras. It's like uh, these module categories are, uh, are sent to, to the category of representations of boxes, so some bimodules over co-algebra structures, or s consider some subspace problems, uh, generalization of matrix problems, and there, there are some reductions. So if algebra is not, uh, I mean, this image of algebra is not wild, then we have reduction, we reduce, 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 that finally we get this one parameter uh, families of indecomposables. But, well, I wish that such nice theorem has some elegant short proof. I don't know if this is possible. Or maybe f uh, the world of finite dimension algebra is not rich enough to, to, to get such proof. Well, if we consider only quiver without relation, so not bound quiver but quiver, uh, this corresponds to some algebra which we call them hereditary path algebra of quiver, and we could think about, well, when we have finitely many indecomposable objects, when we have infinite, uh, but if we have infinite, if the, uh, they are tame, so uh, in principle that if we can classify them or not. So uh, the first result is due to Gabriel also. If Q is a represent, uh, Q is rep of represent finite representation type, if and only if Q is a Dinkin quiver. So Dinkin quivers uh, means that quiver that underlying non-oriented uh, graph is Din Dinkin graph. And Dinkin graphs uh, uh, appear in many different subjects of mathematics, among them about Lie groups and algebras, and in many classification uh, of simple singularities and so on. And in fact, there are some connections. Uh, so namely, in such cases, uh, each indecomposable representation is uniquely determined by its it's dimension vector, dim uh, vector uh, which coordinates are, uh, whose coordinates are uh, dimensions of particular vector spaces. And these vectors are roots of corresponding quadratic form. And so on, there are many connections. Well, if Q is not Dinkin, we have infinitely many of the uh, representations, but maybe uh, we, ha we have tame situation. And then the result due to Reuter Nazarova is that if and only if Q is an extended Dinkin quiver. Well, uh, Dinkin quivers we know. I mean, here each uh, edge you should put arrow, doesn't matter orientation. So a n for n greater or equal one. Mm, in the past we had example of a three. D n for n greater or equal four. Uh, that two vertices at the ends that are split, like this, and three special cases known E6, E7, E8. So if this is linking quivers and extended, what I mean by extended quivers, these are version we say tilde usually denoted, and we need to add one more vertex and connect them. So in a n case, uh, extended version would be that one vertex connected with to ends. In dn, we have addition, additional vertex here, it's also such splitting. In e6, e7, e8, it's different. So in e6, we need one above. In e7, one vertex on the left more, and in e8, on the right. Yeah, and so also, it's nice, nice fact that uh, some properties, uh, how complicated categories of representations are, are reflected by uh, by notion of this thinking or extended thinking quivers. So I try to give some small advertisement uh, for representations of algebras. Nowadays this, uh, this theory splits and uh, has many connections with uh, 
other, uh, other subjects. So at the beginning 90s, for example, was a uh, big relationship with quantum groups um, and so on and so on. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, are there any questions, remarks or comments regarding the talk? Uh, I have a question. <laughs> then. Oops. Uh, so this last theorem is like a con construct, uh, I mean the first part of Gabriel as well. So this is like a constructive counterpart of this uh, Gabriel theorem, which was stated at the very beginning, right? So, mm, should it yeah. be understood? Uh, you so can think about this, but this were uh, like independent work. Yeah? yeah, but in some sense, it gives the shape of the quiver which is expected to exist by this first theorem. Do no, I understand? No, no, no. So, uh, could you could you make the relation of these two results? Well, I don't at the moment. Always uh, standing at the, at the blackboard is much worse. Uh, it's more difficult to think. Yeah? Mm -hmm. but, uh, I don't see much uh, relationship between these theorems. I mean, the first one says that. Uh, you are expect to construct the quiver, yes? Yeah, yeah. So for and uh, and here you have some shape. So my simple-minded question is as follows: So to which extent the first theorem is constructive? I mean, given. Uh, okay, okay. Because in the first theorem, in fact, uh, appear bounded quivers. Mm. And bounded quivers, if they are represent of fi finite representation type, we don't know much about Q. There are some restrictions, but quiver itself can be tame, can be wild, can be quite complicated with oriented cycles. And in such a way, it has not much relation now with Dinkin quivers. Of course, there are also examples that uh, this quiver is, is of Dinkin type, so from this classification we, we get then under understanding. But is there any way to predict what kind of quiver should you get in uh, this first? Well, there were some... In in 80s there were some uh, development of... Uh, people tried, for, in, for instance, uh, Bongards tried to classified some sense uh, maximal uh, representation finite uh, bound quivers and it seems very difficult subject so using covering theory you restrict to some special uh, classes and then and then there are some lists but Quivers itself are usually are very complicated. This is really different world because here in thinking quivers we don't have non-oriented or oriented mm -hmm. cycles, mm -hmm. and this makes life much much easier. And in other uh, situation we have m many oriented cycles, sometimes too independent, and so on. And then classification is mm, it's not, uh, I would say, even these pictures of how the writing quivers are not so, uh, they have no so beauty as for drinking quivers. Mm. Yeah. Any other questions? If not, then thanks to the speaker. speaker.